Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. My name is Fan Yang. Uh, I'm the founding director of International Dispute Resolution Academy, IDRA. It's my great pleasure to kick off today's webinar, jointly organized and presented to you by the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, SCIA, International Dispute Resolution Academy, IDRA, and 39 SX Chambers. Firstly, please allow me to very briefly introduce Professor Peter Malanzuk, who will be delivering the welcome and opening speech shortly. Professor Dr. Peter Malanzuk needs no introduction. He's a German national. Currently, he's a council member, chairperson of Strategic Development and Rules Making Committee of the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration. Director, Chairperson of Rules Making Committee, South China International Arbitration, Hong Kong. Expert Member, China Supreme People's Court International Commercial Expert Committee, Adjunct Professor, Law Faculty, Hong Kong University, Academic Advisory Council, University of Heidelberg. Former positions held by Professor Malanzuk include um, em Emeritus CV Star Professor of Law, Peking University of Transnational Law, Dean and Chair Professor, School of Law, City University of Hong Kong, Professor and Head of Department at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, and Am Amsterdam University, Research Fellow, Max Planck Institute, Heidelberg, Legal Advisor to the President of the Iran United States Claims Tribunal, Legal Counsel of Iraq, before the UN Compensation Commission in Geneva uh, for the 1990 Gulf War and also special legal counsel of Ethiopia for the 1998 war with Eritrea. He has held visiting professorships at Michigan Law School, Bold Hall Law School, University of California at Berkeley, Mexico State, Lomonosov University, Addis Ababa University, Ethiopia, Hebrew University, Jerusalem, and several honorary professorship uh, appointments at leading universities in China. He's an external scientific fellow of the Max Planck Institute Luxembourg for International European and Regulatory Procedure Law. He's an honorary editorial advisory board of several international journals, including the Chinese Journal of International Law. Thank you, Professor Peter Malanzuk, for joining us today. Now, over to you. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fan Yang, for your kind introduction. Um, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, webinar, which uh, I hope will, you will find very interesting. Uh, my short uh, presentation uh, will focus on the concept of uh, due process and uh, due process and document production, discovery, and disclosure with uh, reference to some recent case developments in the United States, uh, primarily dealing with foreign seated arbitrations and uh, discovery requests for documents in the United States. And then I will say something about the SCIA rules, uh, time permitting. So um, let me start with the uh, concept of uh, due process uh, in general as an instrument to protect private rights and restrain government powers by law. It is most well known, I think, from the uh, United States Constitution, but the origins are, of course, found in English history and the development of English common law. The starting point probably is the Magna Carta of 1215, which stipulates no freeman shall be taken or imprisoned except by the legal judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. And in later English statutes, this became to be replaced uh, by due process or synonymous with due process. In the US federal constitution, the Fifth Amendment of 1791 stated, no person shall be deprived of, liber of life, liberty or property without due process of law. So there we have the term and that was repeated in the 14th Amendment in 1868. Now, I'm not going to go into the distinctions between substantive due process and procedural due process under US constitutional law, because that's a bit outside of our interest. Uh, I just would like to state that the phase has generally no clear fixed meaning. And uh, it uh, is also 
significant that in England, it seems that the term has come to be largely replaced by references to natural justice or rule of law. At least this is what Geoffrey Marshall, a well-known leading UK constitutional theorist has once uh, emphasized when looking at the body of English legal writing. It has, the term has in international arbitration, a fundamental significance as well. In the special field of investor arbitration, we have uh, due process elements relevant for expropriation to make it lawful. Uh, we have uh, references to, us, to it in the standard of fair and equitable treatment and generally in the general treatment of aliens. But for arbitration in general, it is known as a general precondition of arbitration and the procedural cornerstone of the rule of law in international arbitration. And why? Of course, because substantive rights of parties are determined by binding decisions of arbitral tribunals. This means that an award can be challenged if this due process requirements are disrespected, either under national arbitration statutes or problems can be made with regard to its enforcement under the New York Convention of 1958. Article 18 of the Ancitral Model Law lays down core principles of the process and it says the parties shall be treated with equality and each party shall be given a full opportunity of presenting its case. So this is the fair and efficient conduct of the arbitral proceedings that the drafters had in mind and these requirements are mandatory and confirmed as such by national courts. The ancestral arbitration rules have been amended, uh, as uh, many of you will know. The 1976 version stated that any party should be afforded a full opportunity to present its case at any stage of the proceedings. That's in Article 15.1. But the revision of the rules in 2013 merely provides now for a reasonable opportunity to present one's case at an appropriate uh, stage of the proceedings. Now, uh, we have no binding rules on the international level on the modalities of observing due process in international arbitration. We'll talk about the uh, IBA rules differently. These are not binding rules, but guidelines which can be adopted by the parties or used by uh, the tribunal. But we have one good summary with reference to the rules of natural justice in a case by the New Zealand High Court in the trustees case, which uh, is from 1992. Unfortunately, it's too long, more than a page that uh, would be allowing me to uh, cite this here. I'd rather go on to due process paranoia, which refers to uh, the habit of counsel of one or the other parties to send detailed pleadings uh, to the tribunal prior to the award, uh, reserving the client's rights in respect of an alleged procedural slight in the hope of creating a platform to challenge the award or resist enforcement if their client should be unsuccessful in the arbitration. So uh, this uh, due process paranoia seems to have led arbitral tribunals to give uh, um, uh, in to extension requests or to documents that have been newly filed after the hearing, for example, increasing the cost and the delay of proceedings and has met with criticism in the arbitration community. The question is, of course, how to solve this problem, uh, taking into account that the risk of uh, uh, being uh, of an award not being enforced because of alleged due process problems seems to be relatively minor. Uh, looking at the practice of tribunals, but I'm sure our panelists will have opportunity to enter into more details in that regard. Now, uh, I will not go into the details uh, of uh, due process and document production, discovery and disclosure. Uh, I think there will be other panelists which will be discussing the precise meaning of those terms with reference to the applicable uh, national law or arbitral rules, but it should be noted that the uh, Redford Hunter textbook on international commercial arbitration speaks of a cultural class 
culture clash when re referring to the differences between common law and civil law systems in this respect. And the view of the Redford Hunter textbook is that subject to any mandatory rules of the lex arbitri or agreement of the parties, the process as discovery has no place in international arbitration. Now, this is a a bit harsh statement perhaps because it depends on the the interpretation one gives to discovery under the applicable national uh, law the procedural law or, or under arbitral rules uh, and of course under the agreement of the parties so we will have to see and i think our cases later will give ample opportunity to discuss this we have to bear in mind the differences between adversarial and inquisitorial approaches in common law and civil law systems to which the differences in the uh, attitude towards the production of documents of, is of course inherently uh, tied to and the different perceptions of how to arrive at the truth in such proceedings uh, are also relevant without being able to say that either one or the other approach is better than, uh, than the next. Um, for civil law jurisdictions, uh, we may have perhaps later on uh, opportunity to discuss certain developments in German German law, where the German civil code of uh, the code of civil procedure has been amended in 2002 to allow for a little bit more room uh, of uh, document production from the other party, if even if the evidence is unfavorable to the to that party. So uh, there might be interesting questions of whether there has been a narrowing of the gap between civil law and, uh, and uh, common law systems, taking into account the changes in England after the Lord Wolfe reforms in uh, 1996 and the Civil Procedure Act of 1999. But I will skip this and also not go into the arbitration rules uh, and their relevance and the uh, relevance of the IBA rules on the taking of evidence in international arbitration, uh, which are in the, the edition of 2010 now, their purpose was just to say that, uh, to harmonize a bit civil law and common law approaches and to get a global standard uh, accepted. They can be used as guidelines by the tribunal if the parties do not ag agree on their strict interpretation but they are also requiring a narrow and specific uh, request for the documents. And there must also be uh, some uh, uh, relevance, which is, uh, has to be relevant to the case, but even more than that, it must be material to its outcome. And in that sense, we have a, a quite uh, clear restrictive view on what kind of document production is available under those rules. It's, uh, it's not US style broad discovery, but it's, uh, it's also not a narrow uh, type of uh, evidence uh, management as in some civil law systems. So, now let me come to the US discovery cases. And here uh, we want to talk about a provision in the US civil code, which is on this slide. Uh, uh, cited on this slide, uh, section 1782. And on this slide, you see a list of cases. The first one is the only case decided by the US Supreme Court uh, in uh, this matter. And the others are conflicting, or at least some of them are conflicting decisions of federal circuit uh, courts, co courts of appeal in the United States system, which as you know, has 13 of these the circuits, uh, including the federal ones. And uh, under this provision, US courts may order non-parties within their jurisdiction to provide testimony or to produce documents for use in proceedings in a foreign or international tribunal at the request of the tribunal or any interested person. So it seems that anyone in the U European Union or elsewhere in the world, in Hong Kong or in Malaysia or Russia, can apply directly to an American court for assistance in obtaining evidence that can be used in proceedings before foreign and international tribunals outside of the United States, including civil law countries like Germany, France, or the Netherlands, which do not recognize broad US style documents, but could make use of broad US style documents to uh, 
have evidence uh, produced uh, in the United States and possibly outside. That's a disputed issue, whether outside evidence is also covered by that. Now, the only case decided by the US so far is the Intel case in 2004. That's the first case, Intel Corporation versus Advanced uh, Micro Devices on the slide. And there at issue was the Directorate General for Competition of the European Union Commission. And that the court, the Supreme Court qualified as a tribunal, this Director General of the EU Commission and said that this commission body was rendering rulings in antitrust enforcement proceedings as a first instance subject to judicial review. And this would amount to an administrative quasi judicial proceeding abroad, which is covered by the definition uh, of tribunal in uh, the uh, section 1782. Note please that this decision, the Intel case did not involve an arbitration. So it was a quasi judicial proceeding, not an arbitral proceeding. And therefore we had a, the stage set for a continuing controversy on the issue of whether section 1782 applies to private international or foreign arbitrations seated outside of the United States. So that US style discovery requests can be directed against non parties in the United States. Uh, another question is whether 1782 can serve as a basis for discovery requests concerning documents held outside of the United States, but we'll leave that aside. We're just concerned with the first question, whether private international arbitral proceedings are covered or not. And here on that question, we have now a circuit split in the United States judicial system. And uh, as a starting point, first, uh, you have to note that uh, section 1782 does apply without dispute, uncontroversially, to treaty-based investor state arbitration. So arbitrations which are based on BITs, bilateral investment treaties, or foreign, in, foreign trade agreements with investment chapters. In those cases, US district courts regularly admit discovery requests. And it has been used, for example, in the Chevron case extensively in the dispute between uh, Chevron and uh, Ecuador. The question we are concerned with relates solely now to commercial arbitration, private international commercial arbitrations and the second and the fifth circuits in the US say it does not apply to such proceedings, whereas the sixth and the fourth circuits say, yes, it does apply. So we have a clear split. There are other cases in the pipelines now going to appeal to the courts of appeals in the seventh ninth and third circuits as well coming from district courts in their uh, jurisdictions. So there is a, a, a clear uh, demand, uh, I think that this needs to be clarified by the Supreme Court of the United States and there are already petitions expected to go up in that regard. So we will have to see. I just want to mention the last case on the list, particularly Sorry. namely the Guo case, because that involves a CTAC arbitration where a discovery request has been brought uh, to the uh, Second Circuit. And here, Guo, Guo uh, invested some 26 million in three ocean entities, Chinese companies created by uh, uh, Mr. Xi. And Guo sold these entities in allegedly fraudulent transactions below fair value. And one of these entities later became part of Tencent Music later on. And there was an arbitration, a CTAC arbitration initiated in 2018 by Mr. Guo against Xi, Tencent and several other entities. A request for discovery was issued in New York against four investment banks concerning their role in Tencent's initial public offering. And there the district court denied the petition and the case went to the Second Circuit. The Second Circuit upheld its the decision earlier in the 1999 national broadcasting case. That's the second case on the list uh, on your slide and argued it was not affected by the Supreme Court's holding in the Intel case. And it confirmed that in its view, 
international commercial arbitration panels are not foreign or international tribunals in the sense of uh, section 1718. Now the next question was whether CTAC arbitration is a private arbitration and therefore outside the scope of 1782 because 1782 does cover the state arbitration forms and administrative and quasi-arbitration, uh, quasi-judicial uh, proceedings. So to make sure that uh, CTAC arbitration is excluded, uh, the Second Circuit had to make clear that CTAC arbitration is private arbitration. And this is relevant because in its origin, the circuit had found the argument that uh, CTAC was created by the Chinese state, by the government, and therefore the issue was, is that, does it still qualify as a uh, private uh, institution? What mattered in the view of uh, the Second Circuit was whether it possesses the functional attributes most commonly associated with private arbitrations, degree of affiliation with the state, functional independence and control of jurisdiction by contract uh, were elements of that evaluation. And it said, although CTAC was created originally by state act action, it evolved into a form of private arbitration and therefore the decision that uh, it uh, could not uh, bring a request for discovery because not being covered by the section 1782 stands. That's an interesting case. There's another CTAC arbitration case with the dis discovery request under that provision in another circuit, but I will not go into that. Now, I will just say something briefly at this point on the relevant SCIA rules and practice because my colleague, Ms. Chen, will later on be addressing that as well. And I'm sure she's highly qualified to, to do that because she's one of our outstanding arbitrators at uh, the Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration. And uh, I will just uh, point out that on this list of SCIA rules, uh, we, have, uh, we will be concerned primarily with the first one, the SCIA arbitration rules, not with the other rules which are uh, on, on this slide. And here in the middle, uh, of the discussion will be Article 36 on conduct of hearings, which says, un un unless otherwise agreed by the parties, the tribunal shall have the power to decide procedural matters and conduct the arbitration in a manner as it considers appropriate. The tribunal shall, and I quote part of it now, treat the parties fairly and equitably and shall afford reasonable opportunities to all parties to make submissions and arguments. Article 36.6 allows the parties to adopt inquisitorial, adversarial, adversarial, or other approaches in oral hearings. And then we have a provision in Article 42.6 allowing the parties to agree on the applicable evidence rules, uh, which uh, the, the agreement prevails. But we have to note that the IBA rules that we have discussed earlier on are not much used in uh, mainland China and uh, therefore uh, not uh, particularly relevant uh, with uh, regard to practice. There are burden of proof rules in Article 36, 2 and 3. And there are also, there is also an important provision in 44 where the Article 44, where the tribunal if it considers it necessary or where a party so requests, the arbitral tribunal may undertake investigations and collect evidence on its own uh, initiative. Now I will stop here by simply mentioning that SCIA rules reflect Chinese laws and practice and generally there is no discovery concept in that, at least not in, in the sense that we would uh, apply it in the United States and probably also not in the sense of disclosure as it is used in the UK. Um, but there are some exceptional uh, situations which we might want to uh, discuss. And uh, also we would uh, perhaps want to discuss later on whether we have any experience with enforcement. And, uh, the Thank you very much indeed. You process. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Malanzuk. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we are running behind our schedule. So I will be very quick uh, when I, uh, I'll just quickly introduce uh, our 
next speaker of the round table, Professor Davy Bringmore Thomas QC uh, from 39 Access Chambers. Um, you can all find Davy's full profile uh, on the website. I would just very quickly highlight that uh, Davy uh, is the former chair of the Board of Trustees of the Child Institute of Arbitrators, uh, having represented the Child Institute at the Ancestral Working Group on International Commercial Arbitration for its work on amendments to the Ancestral Model Law and the Ancestral Arbitration Rules. And he's also a member of the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC Commission on Arbitration. So without further ado, please, David, um, now over to you. And thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope everyone can hear me properly. Um, I, I will endeavor to be uh, brief. Um, I hope you can see my um, first, my, my slides. Um, Oops, Daisy. Sorry, I need to press that. So you should now be able to see my slides with a slightly provocative um, titles or subtitle that occurred to me as I was preparing for this talk. Is there a force majeure provision in the New York Convention? Um, because I wish to speak about arbitration due process and procedural irregularities in the time of COVID-19. Now, um, Professor Malinchuk took us through the idea of, of due process and its history and, 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 and where we can find it in um, present international arbitration law and practice. Um, but during COVID, we have been discussing the, the performance of contractual obligations uh, as if they were um, governed by force majeure and, and affected by force majeure. And I, I think that's right. That's not a debate I wish to have uh, this afternoon. Um, the question is, are we actually dealing with force majeure in relation to the way in which we deal with international arbitration as well? Because some people have approached procedural matters as if that is the case. Um, I suggest not. Um, and the way to test that, in my, in my view, is to consider, as Professor Malinchuk identified, issues around enforcement. Because where an international arbitral award is voluntarily complied with, questions of how it was reached, in fact, won't matter uh, to the parties uh, or, or to others. It will only be tested when, when, when a party resists enforcement. So taking as our starting point <clears throat> for that, uh, that takes us to Article 5 of the New York Convention with which I'm sure everyone on this uh, webinar is familiar. Recognition and enforcement of the award may be refused. Um, just you can see this. Recognition and enforcement of the award can be refused at the request of the party against whom it's invoked, if they can demonstrate that uh, they were otherwise unable to prevent rather sexist 1950s language, his case, or the composition of the authority or the arbitral procedure was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties. So that's going to be the, the starting point for testing procedural irregularities um, that are adopted in relation to or in response to COVID. That's reflected in uh, the model law 2006. Uh, the party should be treated with equality and each party should be given a full opportunity of presenting his case. Um, again, as Professor uh, Malin should very helpfully identify, that was softened, uh, in fact, when the same provision was revisited in 2010 when the Uncentral rules were uh, reissued uh, and became a, full op a reasonable opportunity uh, of presenting a case. And from my own jurisdiction, where I frequently practice, um, and particularly in relation to the enforcement of awards, um, a tribunal shall act fairly and impartially as between the parties, giving each party a reasonable opportunity of putting his case, dealing with that of his opponent, and adopt procedures suitable to the circumstances of the particular case. Um, again, in terms of uh, institutional rules, uh, we see a very similar position um, not only in the UNSTRAL rules as already identified by Professor Malanchuk, but in the ICC rules 2017 at Article 22, in order to ensure effective case management, the tribunal may adopt such procedural me measures as it considers appropriate. Uh, and in all cases, the tribunal shall act fairly and impartially and ensure that each party has a reasonable opportunity to present its case. So I think in testing the procedural responses 
uh, that have been adopted and are now being adopted by tribunals and by parties in response to the issues uh, that have arisen with COVID-19. That is the background against which I think these procedural uh, issues must be tested. Um, whatever remarkable uh, approaches taken by parties uh, will not matter uh, if there is voluntary compliance with an award, but a party that complains that a procedural step that's been taken uh, should allow it to resist enforcement is going to have to ground its argument on Article 5.1 of the New York Convention, the way in which that is incorporated into national laws, the way in which that is incorporated into rules. So turning um, to COVID, um, just trying to capture the procedural issues and problems raised by COVID-19. Um, COVID-19 has led to restrictions on travel within countries and internationally. And I don't need to remind anyone on this webinar uh, of, of international arbitration's former addiction to international travel. Um, some of our friends and colleagues uh, haven't turned right going into an aircraft for, for very many years because of their practice. Um, so there are now restrictions on travel within countries and internationally. Um, there are restrictions on association within countries. You know, the mere fact that you have to stay within your home city. Um, cities are in lockdown. There are quarantine periods. So if you travel, you then can't um, uh, uh, go out of your own home or hotel. And some vulnerable groups are having to undergo shielding and isolation uh, so as to protect their health. There are restrictions on face to face meetings, um, and there are prohibitions of different activities across different jurisdictions. It's not even as if there is a global public health response uh, to COVID 19. What is allowed in one jurisdiction is prohibited in another. Um, and these are obviously to deal with uh, the risk of illness for individuals contagion and the spread of COVID-19. Uh, and there is, of course, a risk or a concern in terms of stories that one sees of the spread of COVID-19 on packaging and paper and documents and the like. Um, certainly in, in, in the UK, if you uh, return uh, an item to a shop or the likes, it may be left for 48 or 72 hours before it's uh, put back out to stock. Books are uh, once read, if they're not purchased, they're put back onto, um, uh, not put back onto display immediately. So there is even a difficulty with sending packages and documents from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, those matters lead to restrictions on, uh, in terms of arbitration. First of all, on, in terms of physical attendance, um, there are difficulties for lawyers meeting clients to take instructions and prepare cases. Uh, meetings with witnesses and experts can be difficult. Uh, attending arbitral institution offices can be difficult. The physical, the, 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 the practice of physically delivering a request for arbitration to the ICC or other arbitration institution um, is now sometimes prohibited, sometimes impossible because institutions are working uh, remotely. Conferences of expert witnesses may be difficult on a face-to-face -face basis. Hearings are difficult on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, taking, just breaking down what an arbitration hearing is. I can think about two or three years ago of chairing uh, a hearing in Stockholm in a gas price arbitration, a fairly regular um, arbitration where we had 30 to 40 people in the room at any one time. Large gatherings for long periods in closed rooms are now prohibited. Um, there is the further risk that if one person came down with a, uh, an infection during a hearing, um, there would be significant disruption and expense uh, requirements to quarantine and the likes. There are problems with travel for hearings. There are problems with paper bundles. So what has that led to? Well, that's led to, uh, first of all, virtual hearings. Uh, but there is a complaint with that. that. With virtual hearings, there is an effect on oral advocacy. There is a loss of immediacy between the advocate and the tribunal. There is the loss of the effect of body language. There's an effect on cross-examination. Uh, timing with the witness is more difficult. Again, body language, although we can criticize the use of body language as, a, as an indicator, but that body language response that some people rely on in cross-examination is lost. 
And there are the logistics of remote uh, dealing with remote witnesses. Uh, and it's also the case that Zoom calls are found to be very tiring. Paperless bundles, which may be necessary to coordinate everyone on a, a Zoom call, uh, may lead to uh, issues of lack of familiarity with technology. Uh, manipulating PDF, large PDF bundles is a skill that some have and others don't. May require new skills. There may be inequality of access to technology and there may be data protection concerns. So there aren't immediate uh, solutions even to the problems that arise with virtual hearings or paperless bundles. Um, other things that have been done to respond to, to, to COVID, well, some proceedings have been delayed, but that inevitably means that cases take longer to resolve. There is no guarantee that delay will in fact avoid problems with second waves of COVID or whatever uh, the, the, the medical scientists predict. Other arbitrations are pressing ahead with timetables in any event, but clearly uh, with the restrictions on travel and meeting and the likes that may not allow uh, counsel uh, and clients time to prepare or present the case. Uh, it may not allow time for work between the parties to prepare the case for trial or other presentation for uh, the tribunal. Um, and although uh, arbitration institutions may allow virtual filings to deal with attendance, uh, that may in fact lead to problems if uh, there is non-compliance with the institution's rules or a party still needs a physical award for enforcement. I'm presently a member of a tribunal where we have signed the award, the parties are waiting for it to be delivered, um, but it will presently be delivered virtually. If a party wants to get hold of a a physical copy of the award uh, for enforcement or the likes, uh, then other arrangements are going to have to be uh, made. But that's obviously uh, not an easy solution. So the acceptability of those COVID-19 procedural solutions. Well, as I said, there is no force majeure provision in the New York Convention or national laws, uh, simply being slightly provocative. But I suggest that if you test the various procedural solutions that, that I've tried to survey in the last 10 minutes or so, and you test those against Article 5 of the New York Convention, national equal treatment provisions, equal treatment provisions in relevant institutional rules, and ask, was the arbitration in accordance with the party's agreement? And was the party resisting enforcement given the reasonable opportunity to put its case? Then if you answer those questions positively, um, my suggestion is that in fact, arbitration and arbitration tribunals and parties are not having to adopt some sort of force majeure like exceptionalism uh, to procedure in response to COVID. Uh, but in fact, what is being demonstrated is that arbitration is actually sufficiently flexible uh, to deal with the procedural issues raised by COVID-19, albeit each and every time we do something out of the usual, we're going to have to test that against, is each party being given a reasonable opportunity to put its case and meet the case that is put against it? Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the roundtable. Uh, next speaker will be uh, Dennis Brock. And Dennis is the chair of the OMM's International Disputes and Arbitration Practice. And you will find that, uh, Dennis' uh, profile on the website. So now over to you, Dennis. Hello, sorry about that, Fan. Um, it's a pleasure to join you in these uh, new circumstances in what is becoming the new normal of virtual meetings. I will now try to get my slides to share. Right. So, what is discovery? Uh, discovery is a pre trial or pre hearing document production process. And its principal purpose is to ensure fair play. It's to ensure that in civil trials, at least in common law jurisdictions, the parties are enabled 
to ascertain the existence of evidence, uh, whereabouts and details of facts relevant to their claims and defenses. It simply isn't uh, enough that uh, there are pleadings. Uh, you can't fight a case in court on pleadings alone. Uh, you need to support what is said, what you assert uh, with evidence and to challenge the factual basis of one's counterparty. And the evidence is often only found in the documents of one's opponent amongst their files. And therefore to ensure, a, to ensure fair play, uh, way back many, many years ago, many centuries ago, they dis the chance of court, cha courts of chancery in England developed what we now know to be discovery. Um, what are the applicable rules? How is, how is it applied in arbitration? Uh, the, at least in Hong Kong, under the Hong Kong Arbitration Ordinance, there is express power in section 50, 56, which states that unless it's been otherwise agreed, um, an arbitral tribunal may make an order directing the discovery of documents. So that follows that, at least under the ordinance, discovery is not mandatory. Although the practice in arbit arbitration seated in Hong Kong is that discovery is typically ordered uh, following the tr common law tradition uh, operated in our courts. There may be an agreed procedure. Uh, the arbitration ordinance contemplates that the parties are free to agree on the procedure to be followed by the tribunal in conducting proceedings. And if there is no agreement, the tribunal has uh, wide discretion to conduct the arbitration in a manner which it considers appropriate. So in relation to international arbitration, the specific procedure of doc document production is usually fixed by the tribunal in consultation with the parties at a very early stage. The procedure is to discuss and agree at the case management conference, the CMC, uh, what we're going to do with the discovery and memorialize that, memorialize that in the first procedural order of the tribunal. There are, as you've heard, the, there exist the IBA rules on the taking of evidence. Now these were um, carefully uh, agreed between both civil lawyers and common lawyers uh, within the IBA, uh, International Bar Association. And under Article 3 of those rules, which can either be, agreed, can either be incorporated in your dispute res resolution clause, and often are these days, it'll say that discovery shall be dealt with by the IBA rules, or arbitral tribunals may refer to the rules in how they approach uh, ordering discovery. And the rules, uh, being a compromise, state that the request for discovery, request for document production, must sufficiently describe the documents to identify them. Alternatively, you can, do, you can seek a category of documents if the category described is narrow and specific. You also have to give a reasoned explanation as to why the documents you want are relevant to your case and material to its outcome. One has to confirm, rather, you might, might think self-evidently that you don't have the documents and they're not in our possession, in the applicant's possession. And finally, the applicant, the requesting party, has to produce evidence as to why it assumes that the other party has those documents. So there are four aspects. They have to be sufficiently narrowly described. There has to be a recent explanation as well. They're material, material and relevant confirm you haven't got them, and why you think the other side do have them. Under the HKIC rules, which apply if contractually agreed to a Hong Kong seated arbitration, the rules there state in Article 22, the tribunal has the power to order production documents and the tribunal may allow or require a party to produce documents, exhibits, or other evidence that the arbitral tribunal determines to be relevant to the case and material to its outcome. And finally, 
uh, case law. Uh, if the arbitration is seated in Hong Kong, the parties in the tribunal have not agreed upon the application of the IBA rules or some other process. In theory, it would be possible to uh, incorporate the Hong Kong civil procedure rules dealing with discovery, which would give you full-blown common law discovery uh, with the broad disclosure obligations contained in the Peruvian Guano case, the line of authority. That is very rarely done, but is potentially possible if the parties really want it, and being arbitration, they can have it. So, what's the best practice? In international arbitration, I would suggest that adoption of the IBA rules, having been carefully negotiated by both common lawyers and civilian lawyers, does result in a best outcome. That narrow and specific categories of documents are, can be sought only if they are relevant and material to the outcome of the dispute. Um, as we know, or as you may know, under the IBA rules, a party is only required to produce documents on its own initiative upon which it relies. So if you need the document to prove your case, you have to produce it. Uh, this is in broad contra stark contrast to litigation, where a party's obligation is to produce all relevant documents, regardless of whether you rely upon them or not. And the adoption of the IBA rules does give one an efficient, economical, and fair process for the taking of, of, of evidence. Very briefly, I will touch on the Redfern schedule procedure, as I know that SWE is going to deal with this in a little more depth later on. The purpose of the Redfern schedule is to crystallize the precise issues in dispute, making it possible for the arbitration tribunal to make an informed decision as to whether or not a particular document or class of documents should be produced. Having a few technical problems, apologies. The advantage of the Red Fern schedule is that it saves numerous and somewhat likely to be tedious discovery applications between the parties because the process exists, requests are made, uh, requests are either conceded or opposed in uh, written form, and the tribunal takes a decision generally in one off. Finally, bearing in mind the topic of this uh, webinar, is what effect does the de denial of discovery have in terms of enforcement issues? The New York Convention has already been mentioned by David. And one of the grounds that a court may refuse to recognize or enforce an award is if the party against whom the award is invoked successfully proves that it was unable to present its case. In the absence of agreed procedure for discovery, um, in the absence of agreed procedure for discovery, if, request, if discovery is requested and denied by the tribunal, would that give rise to a basis upon which enforcement could itself be denied because the party could claim that it did not have an adequate opportunity to present its case in a fair manner? At least in Hong Kong, um, to establish um, that a party has been uh, denied an opportunity to present its case, the courts will be looking for conduct on the part of the tribunal which is serious or egregious. And whether conduct is serious or egregious is a matter of fact to be decided by the Court of Enforcement. Now, if that Court of Enforcement is in Hong Kong, I will say that uh, uh, it is going to have to be extremely serious and possibly extremely egregious because the courts of Hong Kong are very pro-arbitration, pro-enforcement, and uh, it would be a rare thing indeed for a court to overturn 
in my opinion, a rare thing indeed for a court to overturn an award or not to set it, or not to enforce it because of some alleged mismanagement of the case by the tribunal. Um, so to avoid those problems, the, probably the simplest solution is to, well, is to ensure that the arbitration clause regulates exactly how discovery should be handled. If when you're drafting the arbitration clause, you have enough foresight to realize that at a trial, at a dispute, discovery is going to be, because the nature of potential disputes, incredibly important, then regulate how discovery should be conducted specifically, perhaps by incorpor incorporating in your uh, arbitration clause, the IBA rules. Thank you everybody for um, your patience with my technical issues. Um, and questions will be left until the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. And our next speaker uh, is Sui Im Tan. Uh, Sui is an international arbitrator member of 39 Access Chambers. And again, I will forgive me for cutting short of the introduction. You can find uh, Sui's full uh, profile on the website. Sui, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Fan, and thank you everybody for being a part of this and for having me here. Um, right. So, still on the topic of due process and international arbitration with an emphasis on discovery. We're taking a little bit of a canter around the various jurisdictions and we go a little bit south from Dennis and we come to Singapore and Malaysia. So what I was going to do basically is just talk briefly around a case in Singapore and a case in Malaysia and kind of take on what are the lessons that we get from that. First and foremost, I must uh, convey my gratitude to Cindy Wong Zianyi, an advocate and solicitor in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, who has assisted me greatly with the translation into Chinese. And in the case of Singapore, my thanks goes to Daniel Ang, um, a student who has done some research for me. So the case from Singapore is an interesting one and it's a very recent one, that of Chinese, China machinery against Jaguar. In very simple terms, this was an EPC contract uh, for the, the, the building of a power generation plant in Guatemala. Singapore comes into play because the arbitration is seated in Singapore. And in this particular case, the arbitration clause agreed that it's going to be an expedited arbitration. As it turned out, there wasn't any uh, strict compliance, but it was nevertheless agreed that it would be conducted expeditiously. Long story short, there were project delays. The owner terminated the EPC contract and engaged replacement contractors to complete. The arbitrator found that there was a valid termination and um, the issue was then with regards to the cost of completion and the quantum. There were very interesting issues that came about with regards to discovery because firstly, CMNC, the contractor, was off-site and they could not access the pre-termination project records. By the same token, in respect of post-termination records, Jaguar being the owner, did not want to disclose the documents identifying the replacement contractors because they were afraid that CMNC might use the information and interfere with the completion. So quite a delicate um, situation that was going on there. The tribunal was a really experienced tribunal and they came up with actually very sensible, if not yes or no type decisions and directions. So in some cases, there was an AEO regime, attorney's eyes only. And in this first stage, as you can see from the slides, it's disclosed only to external counsel and expert witnesses, but not to CNNC's employees. And then in the second stage, they were also um, given access, uh, was given to the employees. There was also the redaction ruling with certain exceptions for small claims. I'm not going to go into every single detail. The slides will be provided to you later. And also on the cost of completion, because the completion contracts were ongoing, um, these costs were actually provided on a rolling basis. Long and short of it is that 
CMNC did not do very well in the arbitration. And after the event, they went and challenged that award and complained of various things with regards to discovery. As you have seen, the various orders for discovery were quite interesting. But what did the Court of Appeal finally say? The Court of Appeal was actually very sensible in allowing the tribunal to manage the situation and actually to give them a lot of leeway. Now, this is really in keeping with all the model law, um, Rule 18, and the various IBA rules for taking evidence, and most of the things that people like ourselves in modern law, common law countries are used to. So they actually basically said that the AEO regime was a reasonable order for the tribunal to make. The redaction ruling subsequently mitigated any prior unfairness. And besides, CNNC had expressly agreed to the redaction. In terms of the pre-termination document, well, there was not even a request for that. So it appears that it wasn't actually required. And with regards to the cost documents that were being provided on a rolling uh, nature, again, CNNC had agreed to that. And in the interest of time and progressing the arbitration, it was reasonable for the tribunal to balance Jaguar's interest against uh, in presenting their supporting material against CMNC's reasonable opportunity to defend. Noted also that parties had agreed to expedite the proceedings and that CMNC had themselves asked to bring forward the evidentiary, evidentiary hearings. These are important issues because they go towards the Court of Appeals decision. As was touched on earlier, in this case, they talked about the full opportunity of presenting one's case following Model Law Article 18. But the Court of Appeal in Singapore is very clear that that opportunity is not unlimited. And furthermore, it is context specific. What I thought was actually very instructive was that the court said that in undertaking this exercise, the tribunal's decisions can only be assessed by reference to what was known to the tribunal at that time. And that it follows that the alleged breach of national justice should have been brought to the attention of the tribunal at a material time and not long after, as was the case here. And as I said earlier, the court will accord a margin of deference to the tribunal on matters of procedure, on procedure and not simply intervene. There were some telling remarks in the Court of Appeals um, decision and that effectively they criticized CNNC's conduct and basically said that their conduct was at odds with the argument that they were running in challenging the award. And as a result of which, they basically said that at the very least, the complainant should have requested to suspend the proceedings until the alleged breach had been remedied. However, although that is a valid comment, one also has to take into account the fact that I'm not sure how valid or how practical would have been given that parties had agreed to an expedited procedure. But long and short of it is that CMNC's continued participation and not bringing up their complaints in a timely manner in the end led to their downfall and they did not succeed. So basically, I think that the message out here basically is that you need to see what was happening at that particular time. And if you had a complaint, make that complaint. Don't wait until it's too late. So that's Singapore. Going up north to my home country of Malaysia. This is a court of appeal decision and it was reported last year. And again, I need to convey my thanks to Mr. Wun Yu Jian, who helped me with the research and also with some of the translation. This was also another 
case of new process and discovery. And in this contract, Opnet was the main contractor to provide high-speed broadband network to the state of um, Selangor. And they subcontracted the design and build of the network infrastructure to TM. Opnet and the state of Selangor had a dispute and that was eventually settled and reduced into a settlement agreement which was entered into a consent judgment which also provided that the terms of the settlement agreement shall remain confidential. But in the subcontract arbitration, TN basically wanted to know whether that settlement meant that Opnet had already been compensated. That would have been a great defense for the subcontractor. And so they applied for discovery of the settlement agreement, which the arbitrator refused on the basis of confidentiality. The High Court allowed discovery and said that confidentiality is not a determinative factor and so on and so forth and went on to say that the High Court had the jurisdiction to order discovery. But the judge gave that order with certain qualifications, as you can see on the slide. So this satisfied, this matter went up to the Court of Appeal. And the court of appeal set aside the high court's order and said, again, in a very pro arbitration, pro tribunal, pro tribunal stance, basically said that the findings of fact of the arbitrator are binding on, on the court. So, what they're saying here basically is that confidentiality on its own is not a be-all and end-all. And that leaving aside public interest privilege and legal professional privilege, which is not to be uh, considered here, it's actually the exercise of discretion must be taken care, must, must be taken, regard must be taken of the disclosure of the confidential documents. Yes, it may involve a breach of confidence, but that in itself is not going to be a block for disclosure. So at the end of the day, we come back to the basic issue at hand. And it's the same thing that you have heard with respect to the other jurisdictions. Greater flexibility is conferred on procedural matters to the tribunal. And even if such flexibility comes to the expense of a party's fair opportunity to be heard and to present its case. And as always, discovery applications must not be must not be treated or misused as a manner of so-called um, appealing against an arbitration award. The Court of Appeal of Malaysia has given a strong statement in support of arbitration and in support of tribunals um, discretion on procedural matters as you can see here. And if necessary for the fair disposal of a case, the arbitrator could order disclosure subject to appropriate safeguards. So confidentiality is not a complete cloak, even in um, this situation. So what we're seeing here in terms of both Malaysia and Singapore are that the tribunal has got a very, very wide discretion with regards to discovery and indeed with regards to procedural matters, which the courts are going to uphold. Of course, this is to be considered within the context of common law country and of a model law country. One of the takeaways I, 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 from these two major cases is that you, know, you can't take anything for granted. If you want something, ask for it and ask for it in a timely manner. Remember that the tribunal has a wide discretion, but as we have seen, that discretion includes being able to give directions that's not simply a yes, you can have a document or no, you can't have it. It can be a compromised position and therefore one has to be sensible in what you ask for. And please do not expect the courts easily overrule or change the tribunal's directions. One case that is not on the slides, which I wanted to mention, 
is another court of appeal case in uh, Malaysia. It's called the Seagull Rose Sindarin Berhad against Master Mulia Sindarin Berhad. And it is uh, a well-written judgment by Justice Mary Lin, then of the Court of Appeal, now elevated to the Federal Court. Her judgment was upheld by the Federal Court just a few days ago on the 27th of August. And that also gives you confidence as to um, how the courts are going to support uh, tribunal's discretion. In this particular case that I mentioned, the Seagull Rose, it was about setting aside again under Section 37 of our Act. And the courts basically said that there is actually a very wide discretion for setting aside under Section 37, and the threshold can be quite low. However, and this is where it becomes important, however, the courts must actually exercise it with the evaluation of relevant factors. And the fact that there has been a breach of natural justice as, um, in, in this particular case is not an automatic conclusion that the award's going to be set aside. So having said all of this, it would appear that in terms of discovery and due process, it is something that you have to manage very, very carefully and very robustly during the course of the arbitration because your tribunal is going to be ones dealing with it and the chances of the courts actually overturning the um, decisions of the tribunal are quite slim. So I'll leave with that um, from the common law jurisdictions and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much, Sui. And our next speaker is Dr. George Nittel Valente, founder of JNV Lawyers and Notaries in Macau. And again, you can find uh, President Valente's uh, profile, full profile on uh, their, his website. And uh, President Valente, over to you now. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I wonder whether you are watching my slides or not. I think so. Are you, are you listening? Yes. Okay. Are we okay? Yes. Now, uh, most of uh, our attendants, I understand, are from common law jurisdictions. And uh, by now they uh, might be thinking, how is it possible to ensure the principle of uh, due process without discovery? That is the theme of our, of our uh, discussion now. And uh, I can anticipate that although both systems have advantages and disadvantages. It is uh, for sure that uh, you, uh, that uh, the system, our civil law system allows uh, and ensures the due process. And so the first question I would say is how do civil law systems safeguard the principle of due process? Let me see. Uh, and the second question will be, to what extent Macau civil law system provides for production of documents? As you know, the uh, production of documents is, uh, uh, is uh, a, a mechanism of uh, discovery. It's uh, included in the, in the discovery. So the... Uh, we have basically uh, to, to ensure a due process, we have two methods of obtaining evidence. One is the inquisitorial method, which is uh, conversant with the civil law. And then you have adversarial method, which is, uh, uh, is the one uh, in the, uh, for the common law system. Now, discovery, you know what it is after the, uh, lecture of uh, Professor Peter and uh, the other the other participants, the other panelists, you uh, know, and then I would jump to the discovery, production of documents, due process without discovery. Let me see where I am. Yes. Okay. Now, there is no discovery in Macau legal system. 
the, in, that means that you cannot submit uh, documents in anticipation. You don't have the obligation to give to the other party uh, any indication or to disclose documents to the other party, but means more than that. Means that you have a moment, a right moment to produce your documents. And this moment is with your claim and with your defense. And then we rely, or we rely on the burden of proof. And the burden of proof, which is uh, uh, the one that is uh, in our civil law system, uh, you have this article uh, 335 of the Macau Civil Code, which says, whoever invokes a right must prove the facts which constitute the alleged right. And then you have another one, another, uh, this, another section which says the proof of the facts suspending, modifying or extinguishing the invoked right is up to the one against whom the right is invoked. And that means that the uh, rules of burden of proof are substantive rules. They are not only procedural uh, law of evidence. Uh, of course, you have uh, formalities, you have procedure to produce your evidence. But this, what I mean is that the rules of burden of proof are substantive rules, the so-called substantive law of evidence. And uh, the, uh, the substantive law of evidence says it's a set of rules regulating the admissibility of means of evidence and the weight of evidence. As the procedural law of evidence is a set of rules regulating the means of offering or producing evidence. So discovery is not uh, is different, is contrary in a way to the system of burden of proof. The system of burden of proof is deemed to uh, assure due process of law because what matters is that each party has the same opportunities to present her or his case and to offer evidence for the fact that she or he is invoking and relying upon. In the, uh, uh, how do the uh, civil law lawyers look at discovery? First, it's not in their mindset and it's not easy for them to understand, maybe as difficult as for the, uh, the common law lawyers to uh, have a different mindset uh, of, for, the, uh, for a different system. And then the civil law lawyers believe or look at discovery uh, thinking that, first of all, they are not used to it. In uh, another aspect, it's not aligned, with this, not aligned with the system of burden of proof. And it may uh, be more costly in terms of time, energy, and resources. And uh, the results obtained uh, may not justify uh, a different system. So doubtfully is effective in relation to the results obtained. And usually it may increase the fees, may mean more expensive uh, uh, proceedings. And I think this is uh, one very, very important issue is the breach of confidentiality. So now how can we have this, uh, how can we, uh, there being no discovery, nor any similar mechanism of listing documents in the possession of the parties. Uh, how can we uh, work within the system of burden proof? It's for the party to present the evidence that she or he need to support his claim or her claim. And how does this, uh, as I mentioned already, the uh, in conducting and participating in the process, Magistrates, court agents, parties must cooperate with each other, giving their contribution to obtain quickly and effectively a fair settlement of the dispute. This principle of cooperation mitigates the uh, lack of discovery or the lack of the obligation 
of uh, one party to disclose documents to the other party. So this is a way of uh, uh, approaching to get to, to lead to similar results. Uh, this principle uh, means that everybody has to cooperate with, uh, with the tribunal and uh, the contribution may be different uh, ways. And then you have uh, um, uh, the following, uh, the following, uh, following section I, I quote is uh, that you also have another way if you justifiably uh, know uh, that the other party has a document and you uh, cannot uh, obtain this document or if you have information uh, that undermines the effective exercise of a right of fulfillment of a procedural duty or obligation, you may ask the tribunal to uh, help you and provide uh, and uh, provide remedy to remove the obstacle. And then this also uh, goes the same way when it comes to production of documents in civil law system, like the Macau one. You, uh, not only the, everybody and the, the, the other party and, or the other parties have the right, a special du duty of cooperation for the discovery of the truth, but also the, uh, you may request the uh, tribunal to uh, order the other party uh, to produce any document that you know or any other evidence, but special, particularly documents that you know that are in uh, that party's possession or third party's possession. And you may ask the court or the tribunal, the arbitral tribunal, or any part with the consent of the arbitral tribunal to request assistance from the court in obtaining evidence, particularly when the evidence to be produced relies upon the will of one of the parties or a third party and they refuse to cooperate. Now, despite these solutions, rarely parties require obtain the cooperation of the other party under those articles. Those articles are quite idealistic. Uh, and as I say, rarely, rarely you obtain the cooperation of uh, the other party, especially if they hold or they try to hide a document that is unfavorable to the party. And then the requesting party has to identify which documents uh, she or he wishes to be produced and has to prove that the documents are relevant to the resolution of the dispute. Accordingly, there is no real production of documents in civil law system. Uh, those articles of cooperation and uh, ordering assistance from the court are designed to produce concrete evidence for the benefit of the court or the arbitral tribunal discovery of the truth. So uh, in conclusion, I would say that, uh, so there is no discovery in civil law systems. The system of burden of proof assures due process there is no real production of documents in civil law system. Unlike the common, in common law systems, where there is a process for the production of documents in civil law systems, there is a process that is essentially, that is essentially the production of evidence only. And uh, then I would uh, like to say that Macau has a very new uh, law of arbitration, which became into force in May early May this year. Uh, and, though, and so I don't have, unfortunately, any test cases uh, with the dispositions of this new law. We still will have to wait for a while until this, uh, this law can be tested. But the law is inspired by the model law and by former uh, laws in force in Macau before this new law became, uh, was enacted. But our law, the, the present law, is very easy to understand, is basically uh, based on the model law. 
So I would like to say that, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I will be happy to answer questions. I'm not sure that we will have time for that. But for those that are still listening, thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, uh, President Valente. And our last speaker today is Dr. Helena Chen. Uh, Helena is a SCIA panel arbitrator, IDRA fellow and partner and joint head of office in China, Pins and Masons. And again, you can find her full profile uh, on her website. And Dr. Helena Chen, please, over to you. Thanks. Oh, hold on. Sorry, I was on mute. I hope you can hear me now. Okay, perfect. Uh, special thanks to uh, Mr. Valente for the very detailed uh, comparison uh, on the rule of evidence on the common law and the civil law. So I, uh, for the interest of time, I would not repeat that. Uh, the, there's one thing that I would like to emphasize is that uh, under uh, civil law system, uh, the documents uh, that must be produced are those on um, which each party intends to rely upon. So um, if you look at uh, the Arbitration Act of the PRC, Article uh, 43, it specifically provides that the parties should provide evidence in support of their own arguments. So uh, as you can imagine that in practice, I would say it's uh, rather difficult for me sometimes to explain to my parties involved in international arbitration and to tell them that you need to uh, uh, share with me uh, all the evidence, all the relevant evidence, uh, not only the evidence that is favorable uh, to your claim, uh, because they are uh, more uh, uh, used to uh, the concept uh, of providing uh, documents that are only uh, in support of their own arguments uh, under uh, PRC Arbitration Act. Similarly, you can also find uh, under uh, SCI Arbitration Rules, Article 42, Paragraph 2, says that each party shall bear the burden of proving the facts upon which its claims, defense, or counterclaims are based. So uh, these are very uh, similar concepts. Uh, then uh, we can uh, also uh, look at uh, the uh, requirements uh, under uh, SCIA Article 43, paragraph, uh, third paragraph, which says that the evidence that the parties have already jointly uh, recognized or have no objection to shall be recognized as uh, documents that uh, evidence that has already been uh, examined. So. Um, it, it is a very uh, important process uh, in arbitrations conducted in mainland China to have the uh, evidence examined. Uh, how do we uh, examine uh, those evidence? We look at the evidence uh, uh, authenticity and the legality and the relevancy uh, uh, to the matter. So uh, this is the requirement uh, uh, actually stipulated in an interpretation of the Supreme People's Court on the application of the civil procedural law. But this um, originally applicable in court proceedings, I would say have a have heavy evidence in uh, arbitration proceedings conducted in mainland China. So uh, in uh, arbitration proceedings administered by Chinese arbitration institutions, uh, you can uh, often see uh, the, uh, the tribunals would request both parties to express uh, their uh, opinions on the authentic authenticity, uh, legitimacy, and the relevancy of the evidence provided by the other party. Um, so um, that is, uh, I would say, uh, pretty uh, different uh, uh, from the uh, the uh, arbitration proceedings in international arbitration. Uh, uh, following that, I think the last point uh, is the grounds for revocation of arbitral award under PRC Arbitration Act. 
uh, if in a domestic arbitration, the evidence on which the award is based was forged can be uh, one of the grounds for revocation of arbitral, domestic arbitral award. Uh, this is um, rather uh, special. So uh, the tribunal would uh, pay uh, attention uh, to specific attention to uh, the authenticity of the evidence in arbitration proceedings. And I think that also uh, concludes my very uh, concise and brief introduction to the uh, practice of uh, the rule of evidence in arbitration proceedings conducted in mainland China. Uh, I'm not sure if we uh, have time for uh, entertaining questions, uh, but uh, you can easily find my contact details here. And uh, uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Helena Chen. Um, unfortunately, we have already run out of time. Uh, we are already behind schedule. And what I would like to propose uh, is that we will proceed to closing uh, by Professor Davy Bringmore Thomas QC. And if you have any questions, please do feel free to contact any of our speakers today. Uh, you will find their um, profiles on their website. And Professor uh, Davy Bringmore Thomas QC, and over to you. Um, Dr. Yang, thank you um, very much. Uh, this has been very enjoyable and very enlightening um, hour, hour and a half. Um, we've had some excellent questions on the um, open uh, questions on the uh, webinar. Um, and indeed, uh, we had uh, two questions, which I'm very sorry we weren't able to take from Direndra Deoja, who is a member of the um, Shenzhen uh, Center panel of arbitrators about the uh, legitimacy of um, video hearings, which I touched on under the ICC and UNCTAD trial rules. Um, I think we'll try to go uh, back to arbitrator Deoja on, on that, because I'm very sorry that we couldn't come to, 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 to those questions. Um, certainly, I mean, Professor Mountrick's tour de force as to the underlying issues uh, of the rule of law, um, starting with Magna Carta, um, and going on through uh, Jeffrey Marshall and then touching on uh, the issues of, of American jurisprudence that concern um, so many of us. Um, and then Dennis Brock's uh, exposition of, 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 of discovery in, in fairness and picking up a theme which really President Valente picked up, which is the foundation of uh, discovery is fairness and an obligation to put all of the documents that you have in your possession um, to the other side, uh, teasing out those underlying historic uh, roots um, by Dennis and Professor Valente was, was, was fascinating for me. Um, Sui M. Tan picked up uh, wonderfully, I thought, um, the issue that uh, discovery is uh, the discretion of the tribunal and the pro-enforcement courts as Dennis Brock said in Hong Kong, in terms of enforcement, pro-arbitration courts will um, recognize the discretion and the arbitrator's discretion uh, in relation to um, what will and won't be ordered, regardless of the system that we're in. Uh, and finally, uh, Dr. Chen's uh, talk just now as to discovery in China, uh, I thought was wonderful. Uh, as I was writing, I was, I was, I was taking notes um, and looking at uh, testing um, the impact of the evidence, um, the authenticity, the legality, and the relevance of the evidence. Um, discovery is one of the ways in which civil law and common law divide so enormously, but we keep coming back to the same sets of concepts of, of fairness, due process, uh, and obtaining uh, the result. So, um, marvelous uh, seminar. I have to congratulate um, our hosts, uh, Dr. Fan Yang, uh, and the SCIA, the Shenzhen Center for International Arbitration. Um, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to everyone for organizing this and for giving me the opportunity uh, to say my little bit. But uh, Dr. Fan Yang, thank you very much indeed. And um, I shall let you close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.
And before I let you go, if I may just take a few seconds to thank our uh, heroes and heroines behind the scene. And this webinar would not have been possible without their support and assistance. They are Ms. Deng Kaixing, Deng Kaixing, uh, Mr. Huang Guoyong, uh, President Liu Xiaochun, Beth Williams and Charlie Leppington, and Mark Winrow. And last but not the least, thank you all for joining us and hope to see you again soon in our next webinar. And in Enjoy the rest of your evening, your day, and good night and good day. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.